What documents did you use to fully explore the question of the Armenian genocide? Mainly the Nuba Pasha Library in Paris, where I was able to retrace the whole history of the Armenians, because what was important, first and foremost, was to understand this people, before looking in detail at what they suffered. This is an Armenian library. An Armenian library, located near the Trocadero in Paris. I then had to procure other books, and other documents were provided by Armenian organizations from their own documentation. The 1990s saw an increasing amount of work on the subject. You could say there was an explosion of interest, as research was carried out in the centers where the documents had never been examined prior to this, especially at the Patriarchate of Jerusalem by Professor Dadrian in the Vienna archives, in the German archives, and in particular the enormous work undertaken by Sarafian in the American archives. There were thousands of documents, if you like. I positioned myself as a historical researcher, especially as regards analyzing existing works done on the archives. Recently, the only archival work I did was to study the documentation provided by the Vatican for the beatification of an Armenian bishop. These documents provided the opportunity to study all the details of the genocide committed in Diyarbakir province, and more specifically in the town of Mardin, which was all the more interesting, as I knew the history of the Armenian genocide, and I now had the opportunity to examine individual detail down to the list of deportees. At the end of the day, this is the type of detail that is somewhat lacking in an in-depth knowledge of the Armenian genocide. Many archives have either disappeared, were kept hidden, or never existed. Records of deportees were not kept with as much accuracy as the lists of European Jewish deportees kept by the German bureaucracy, for example. Documentation is missing. It is possible to piece together a picture from individual details, such as the names of those deported, those who were killed on the spot, the formation of the convoys, and the dates they left. We can finish this work. It seems that the most knowledgeable researchers at present consider that much remains to be done, 90 years later. And did you personally have access to the Ottoman archives? No, the problem with the Ottoman archives is very simple. But first, we should debunk this myth. Certainly, the deportation of Armenians during the First World War was disguised as deportation for military purposes, as this film shows, which automatically means that there are documents placed in the archives for the sole purpose of justifying the principle of deportation itself. You have clearly shown that the deportation order was given immediately after the letter of May the 24th. And of course, all the official measures were archived. This lie was archived. We know very well that the deportation did not happen like that. It was the device, one of the means of carrying out the genocide. These archives contain a number of lies. Furthermore, these are really the only archives in the world, or in any case, amongst the most extensive, to have been hidden, kept secret, for more than three quarters of a century. When they finally announced that the archives were ready to be opened up a few years ago to researchers who were capable of interpreting them, for my own part, I cannot read Osmanli which is Old Ottoman, and researchers with the skills to interpret them arrived. Then, everything depended on their behavior. If these researchers were in the pocket of the Turkish authorities, the archives were open to them. But if they came from other countries, and it was clear that they were looking for answers which these archives might hold, well then, they were swiftly excluded.
There is a kind of duplicity surrounding these Ottoman archives. When people want to deny the reality of the genocide, the historical debate is constantly countered with the argument that all of the archives have not been consulted. However, this is not the issue. The real issue is to find out whether or not we can confirm the evidence of a premeditated mass crime in the documents at our disposal. And that's what has interested me for past 30 years. I set out not to study the Armenian genocide, but to what happened to the Armenians during World War I. And I quickly understood, I knew it was genocide, that this was the evidence of the crime of genocide. That is, the organization of the mass destruction of a group of people based on their belonging to this particular group and according to a premeditated plan, a preconceived plan, a concerted plan. So, the evidence was quickly established. As the work progressed, all I did was to back up this evidence and all the research further supports this evidence. If you like, when you look at the counter-offensive mounted by the Turkish officials, which was clarified somewhat during the 1980s, I think, you can see why. You will notice that uh, they have no other arguments besides the ones they put forward at that time. Whereas now, historical research has uncovered more and more proof of premeditated and organized murder. On va revenir, si vous voulez, un petit peu en arrière et comprendre que le mouvement nationaliste jeune turc... The Young Turks were a nationalist movement that grew from the Turkish Empire's successive defeats in the 19th century. As the Baltic states claimed their independence, and Macedonia in particular, which the Young Turks wanted to keep. Le problème de Macédoine, qui est le territoire que les jeunes turcs veulent préserver, the origins of the movement were threefold, and it is essential to understand them. The Turkish army, amongst Turkish officers in the territory of the Ottoman Empire, in the diaspora, amongst the opponents of the Turkish government, especially in France, but also in Switzerland. And thirdly, in Russia, amongst Turkish Muslims, who were to provide a much wider vision of the Turkish problem. These three groups took power after the Putsch of July 1908, which re-established the constitution and grew in influence inside the Ottoman Empire, extending Ottoman power in the period 1908 to 1914, following two antagonistic trends. One, coming mainly from Paris and the diaspora, which had been in contact with the Armenians, wanted what was known as Ottomanism, a concept based on harmonious coexistence of all minorities and all forming part of the Ottoman Empire. Opposed to this Ottomanism was Turkish nationalism, initially expressed as Turkishness, a concept that can be summarized in the phrase Turkey for the Turkish, and Pan-Turkishness, meaning the expansion of Turkey beyond the Turkey of the Turkish people, and particularly to Azerbaijan, and even beyond to Pan-Turanianism which simply means the dream of reuniting all the Turkish peoples of Central Asia as far as the Pacific. The Armenians constituted an obstacle to this vision for a very simple reason, geography. These Turkish nationalists would lose the Balkans, and as the Balkans splintered during the Balkan Wars, Turkey would be reduced to a tiny stump, the area it currently occupies, a little smaller at the time, around Constantinople. It would be essentially Anatolian Turkey, because the Ottoman Empire was occupied by the Arabs in the south. But the Turks knew very well that they had no future there, as the land belonged to other peoples. But this Anatolia was sacred for the young Turks and their nationalism, and it was also the starting point for their expansionist ambitions into Azerbaijan, first of all, and then further into Asia. So, what race stood between the two? The Armenians. They were the only people, the only large minority 